Hello and welcome to our global panel discussion of the latest Tetra Pak Index, a global research study conducted in partnership with Ipsos that this year is showing a lot of interesting findings. I'm Anne-Therese Gennari, also known as the Climate Optimist, and I base my work on shifting the narrative on climate change so that we can act from courage and excitement, not fear. And I must say that I read this report with wide eyes and a great deal of excitement because it shows that consumer habits have shifted quite significantly due to the pandemic, and if I might say so, in a very optimistic direction. For example, half of the global population now recognize the impact that everyday habits have on the environment. And from spending so much more time at home this past year, there's now a much greater insight into how much waste goes into those daily habits. 61% of consumers are doing more cooking at home than before the pandemic, and a majority are reporting that they will continue doing so in post-pandemic times as well. The main reason, 73%, of this upsurge in home cooking is the ability to minimize food waste while cooking at home. Bottom line, consumers are becoming much more aware and they want to play a part in fueling the transition into a climate positive future. And they're looking to brands to lead the way. With over one third reporting that they are now choosing brands based on their sustainability credentials, more so now than before the pandemic. There's a real opportunity for food and beverage companies with 61% of food and beverage companies leading the way and finding solutions, actually more so than governments on 60% and packaging companies on 57%. A lot of interesting insights. And today is a chance to discuss these findings with industry experts, all of whom are committed to driving the sustainability agenda and three of whom are members of the Tetra Pak Sustainability Advisory Panel, and learn what actions can be taken from corporations as well as consumers to help pull a better and more sustainable world closer. So with that, let me introduce you to a wonderful panel. Rachel Kite is Dean at the Fletcher School at Tufts University, the nation's oldest graduate-only school of international affairs. Rachel has long worked to promote and finance clean, affordable energy and low carbon growth as part of the UN Sustainability Development Goals. Shireen Resterich is the founder and CEO of Hubbub, a social enterprise that aims to solve environmental issues through innovative and inventive campaigns. Shangwa Wu is a policy analyst specializing in China's climate policy and sustainable development and the CEO of Beijing Future Innovation Center, a public and private partnership platform to drive technology innovation for sustainability, as well as China Director for the Office of Jeremy Rifkin. And last but not least, we have Lars Holmquist, Executive Vice President for Sustainability and Communications at Tetra Pak, responsible for ensuring full integration between Tetra Pak sustainability, public affairs, and communications activities. All of you, thank you so much for being here and welcome. So let's dive right in and let's start with you, Rachel, and talk about food because the index shows that 73% of respondents try to minimize food waste while cooking. And looking ahead, 81% of consumers expect to um, make a same or a greater effort to avoid throwing away food when the pandemic restrictions are removed. And this is topping the list of shifted behaviors, which is, in my opinion, so incredible. So, Rachel, what can the industry do to help fuel this new trend and help people minimize their food waste? Well, like you said, it's a really, really important finding and, and very exciting and, and really lays down a, a challenge to policymakers to be able to take that shift in mindset that shift in priority within the general public and be able to translate that then into substantial change. That requires sort of policy to support that. So if you want to limit your food waste, then that means that you need to be able to buy products that are affordable, which are sustainable with less packaging. Uh, so we need the policy that will encourage and indicate that that is the way that uh, the food supply industry should be moving. You need to be able then to be able to dispose of whatever uh, food waste you do have in a way in which that that's kept in a closed loop within our economy. So you need policy for that as well. 
And then I think we have to take care that um, that this is something that happens for everybody. And so for those people who are living with uh, very little access to uh, the food that they would need for a healthy diet uh, and an affordable price, how can we make sure that they are able to be part of this transition as well? And I think this is the developed world, right? So uh, this gives us a very strong indication of the kinds of policy and regulation we need around packaging. We have to also remember that in the developing world, food waste comes between farm and market. And so, again, if we know at the top end of the supply chain, people want to buy uh, things uh, with less packaging, with less waste, uh, then I think there's a lot to be done in terms of the energy policies in developing countries and in big food producers to make sure that, you know, the farmer can actually get their produce to market, improve their income and, and also reduce waste that way. So it sounds to me that it's a very integrated both issue and and um, and way of solving it. It's not just about limiting food waste, but in empowering communities and making sure that food is accessible across the spectrum and, and helping people um, take back the sovereignty of, of food uh, and integrate that into their daily lives as well. Yeah, I think if, if people's sens sensitivity and sensibility about food, about um, the availability of food as a result of the extreme dislocation that many people experienced as a result of COVID-19. If that it brings forward a greater awareness of the importance of sustainability within their food uh, choices, within their healthy diet choices, then we have to be able to take that moment and exploit it positively. And so companies that are involved in the packaging and in the, and in the food value chain can all be part of that within a policy framework that is focused on affordability and sustainability. And we see that those two things are not in juxtaposition. You, you don't have to just have cheap, bad food. You can have cheap, healthy food and you can have um, uh, we can reset the, we can reset affordability in, in our public imagination. So I think that um, too often uh, the choice is between something that's affordable and unhealthy and maybe unsustainably packaged and produced or something or it's seen that the choices which are healthy and sustainable are, are more expensive. That's where we need policy to drive a, a change. And how much would you say that education and awareness plays in, in fueling this as well for the public so that they are more maybe just aware of the, the part that they play too in, in, in helping fuel the solutions for this, this system change? Yes, I think there's a huge opportunity for those people who buy food and then throw a third of it away because they overbuy or because they 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 don't store it properly or they um, uh, you know, portion sizes are too big in the restaurant and you take it home and you don't, you never eat it. I mean, I think if people understand exactly how uh, much that contributes um, alongside their choice of transportation, their choice of energy systems at home, etc., I think that's important. But I don't think that we should uh, set up um, a, a notion that that is uh, the only thing that needs to happen. People are in a food system and the choices that they have and the price points at the at, at where, wherever they buy their food are determined by many, many other factors. And it is that food system which has to provide a healthy diet, sustainably produced for everybody, low income, middle income, high income. And I think that's the awareness at the policy level, which has come forward because of the Food Systems Summit held at the United Nations just a few weeks ago. And, and then bake, put that together with this kind of survey data. I think you see that there is an opportunity for a pivot and there is an opportunity. But this will require the food industry, the agricultural industry, the nutrition people, the food packaging, the every part of the food value chain to come together and for governments to understand that they can actually send signals through this food system to shift it, putting all of the onus on the individual consumer is setting up a little bit of a, of a, of a false dichotomy. We need the system to change. I, just to build on what Rachel said, uh, for a packaging company like Tetra Pak, packaging uh, right sizing can really help to reduce food waste. It may sound very simple, but playing with packaging formats and sizes, consumers can actually select the package that best match their consumption needs, supporting them to continue reducing food waste, which is what they want. 
And in addition to that, there are also some benefits related to meal planning and to delivering safe, healthy food that is resource efficient to produce and to transport, which is what we are trying to do. Now, the second thing is, is clear and simple labeling. It sounds very simple, uh, but it is so very vital that consumers know when the expiry date is and understand what that means. That it means that there's a possibility to consume very often after the expiry date. And it is one of the main culprits in, in the say do gap for consumers. If a best before date has passed, then about one third of consumers wouldn't consider using this food product. Uh, and that's from our index last year, uh, I recall. And, you know, I can't easily check the best before date or expiry date is, is the number one pain point when purchasing online. So according to our recent e-commerce global consumer research, the, um, which, which actually complements this year's index, so making the expiration date labels less confusing, helping consumers with recipes to use products before they expire is absolutely key for a industry like ours. Shangwa, this year's Tetra Pak index shows significant difference in how consumers across the globe respond to different challenges with 70% of respondents in China vowing to avoid excess packaging over the next year. Can you provide some insights into how China specifically compares to other markets when it comes to consumers making sustainable choices and their attitudes towards food safety? Thank you for uh, the question. I think compared to other parts of the world, China definitely presents a sort of unique uh, case or example. Uh, I think as we started talking about it here today, as Rachel many points mentioned by Rachel already, this is, a, this is a system. And within the system, there are many nodes that need to be connected. And uh, yes, the, the Intel actually shows fascinating trends uh, on the consumer side of behavior, you know, in terms of awareness, in terms of mindfulness and thoughtfulness, and the potential willingness actually to change behaviors. But at the end of the, end of the day, if somehow that's not organic actually connected with other nodes uh, within the system, uh, we all know for sure, uh, whatever the aspiration that we want to achieve in terms of you know, sustainability, energy, as well as biodiversity conservation, among others, we wouldn't be able to achieve that. So China actually, uh, particularly top-down, uh, driven in a way compared to many other parts of the world, the government has been stepping up tremendous efforts. And particularly around the waste, uh, household waste issue, recycling issue, I think there were two things actually uh, which have been happening uh, even before the COVID actually, uh, but even more so during the COVID. One is really providing, at, particularly at the city level, urban uh, contests there uh, in terms of uh, household garbage or waste recycling, right? You just have to, people are forced literally at the community level, at the neighborhood level, that you have to really separate sorting your garbages. And of course, you know, in most cases, I think there were four categories roughly divided. You know, you have dried waste, dried waste to wet, as well as sort of, uh, you know, recyclables, and of course, the others there. So consumers, actually individuals, somehow, whether you have the awareness or not, you are forced to take on your responsibility. So every day when you, you know, dump your garbage, you have to make sure facilities, infrastructure, available literally, you know, at your you know, community or neighborhood, you are forced to really do things correctly. And then, of course, after the collection of the waste and then the infrastructure that the value chain continues, they are transported to different locations for different ways of treatment there. I think that's a tremendous sort of progress or achievements made by the government already. It's a fascinating. There are a few hundreds of cities already, you know, mainstreaming that behavior. The second uh, campaign actually related to food and food waste actually is something we call the clean the plate campaign, literally championed by the Chinese you know, president himself. This is mostly targeting restaurants and we do eat a lot, you know, with China stepping into more of a middle class society. Uh, people have more, you know, sort of income, disposable income to spare. So you started to see more and more people going to restaurants, right? And uh, so restaurant food waste has become a huge, huge challenge actually in the country. 
which of course related to culture, to you know, social economic factors, whatever. So now the campaign has been driving forward, literally say, pin down another uh, node or player within the ecosystem, which is the restaurants, right? Beside behavior, the individuals actually. So restaurants are also put in a position that they need to help be held accountable. So they need to watch out that like, the portion of food or whatever in terms of, of course, the end purpose is to prevent or reduce the food lo you know, loss or waste there as well. So in a nutshell, I think uh, compared to many other parts of the world, if you look at the level of you know, awareness, um, somehow I'm not surprised to see the Chinese consumers seem to be more aware of the challenges, partly because, of course, like many others, we live in the current challenges. In the meantime, actually, the government definitely has been playing a tremendous role in terms of enforcing, actually, uh, the connectivity of the nodes within the system so that we'll be able to really drive through, actually, uh, the, target, the policy targets and the behavior change. I think that's probably very unique compared to many other parts of the world. Thank you. And the, the red thread that I'm seeing through the report and hearing you speak is there is this sense of agency that has been regained by the individual because we were so exposed to all this, the whole system from being at home for such a long period of time and, and being in control of everything we're doing from cooking and creating waste and whatnot. We started to really see how we play a part in the biggest system. And so once you see that and you gain that awareness, you become much more empowered in your everyday actions. And I love that you speak on you know, how can we take this a step further and really, you know, address the, the restaurants as well? Because that is a place where you as a consumer don't really have control over how much waste you are creating because you don't know what happens behind the, the, the wall to the kitchen. So that, that's incredible. Thank you so much, Shangwa. And I also want to open this up to any, to you, Lars, Tr Truven or Rachel, if you have any insights into your specific markets that you want to share with the floor, um, please, please feel free to do so also. Thank you. Shall I just give a perspective from the UK? Um, viewpoint. Um, so we've done polling in the UK and everything in the index has, has rings true uh, with the UK. I think when people uh, are forced to cook their own food at home, which many of us were, you suddenly become really concerned about the provenance of that food. You become aware of um, the whole food system around you uh, and you certainly become aware of the amount of food waste you're generating, the cost of that and the packaging. Um, so I think all of these things have, have brought a, a closer connection uh, to, to food for all of us, and that's probably driving a lot of the changes. And I think COVID provided a real shock to people, didn't it? You know, there were there were scenes of like supermarket stores empty of, of food, um, and people suddenly began to realise that everything that they'd perhaps taken for granted in terms of the food system and the provision of food was perhaps a little bit more precarious than they thought, uh, and and that sort of that opens your mind quite a lot to the the wider food system. So within the UK, everything that that uh, the Tetra Pak index has highlighted uh, is is certainly true in, in in this country as well. Yeah, maybe I can give one anecdote. I, I was struck in in California at the height of lockdown when the uh, restaurant and service industries were on the ropes when uh, a lot of elderly people and people with disabilities who couldn't get out were stuck at home without access to food. People were without jobs and food supplies were dislocated. There was a pivot and there was one program where uh, the food uh, restaurants were paid to prepare food that could be then delivered to uh, people who couldn't get out of their homes, the elderly, the infirm. And immediately um, you started to replace a food system that was extremely brittle, um, so value chains that were very brittle and had broken, um, with something that was more circular, more local, uh, employed people, kept restaurants open um, for the provision uh, and, and took care of the, uh, the elderly and the infirm and the, the more vulnerable within our communities. And I think that that's just one example, but there were many others like that. Uh, and I think people want to hold on to that now. And so policy um, and local government, as well as national government, needs to um, ensure that that's sort of sustained. Yeah, I, I would like to probably add uh, two more dimensions. Uh, one related to what China has been doing uh, in terms of the particular around the recycling and stuff like that. I think another driver, which is also have, you know, sort of gearing up very fast in China, 
uh, is this e-commerce and food delivery there as well. I mentioned the restaurant, the Burks, but during the lockdown period, the people wouldn't be able actually to physically go to restaurant. So because now we have e-commerce, we have the digital enabling technology available. So you started to see basically we just literally order, you know, food from restaurant online. So they are delivered actually to your you know, doorstep literally. Uh, on one side, exciting to see the business booming, but on the other side, actually, this uh, both food waste potentially, but also packaging waste there as well. So that's another sort of you know on the top of the agenda at the national government there as well. So that's another sort of exciting trends happening in China, not only addressing the packaging waste, but also plastic there as well. The the other bigger uh, point I do want to make. I think the the findings of the index is fascinating to see, you know, the desire, the behavior change, awareness, whatever. But then actually it, it becomes a supply uh, challenge, meaning on one side, of course, it creates tremendous opportunities for business in particular. Say, okay, the demand is there. How do you make sure actually you really deliver or supply, you know, to meet this kind of demand? That's a fascinating trend to see. I think that's opportunity there as well. But then short term, actually, we started to see uh, the inadequacies. I think supply chain crisis, I think Trump Wynn mentioned early on, you know, basically you go to, you know, grocery stores, so you start to see more and more empty uh, shelves. Uh, so there is a generally a bigger challenge around the supply. We call it supply crisis. As I said, it's both a crisis that somehow short term we haven't been able to address well, but definitely it, it could be turned into a tremendous opportunity for business to lead this sort of, you know, uh, sustainability agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Shanghua. 50% of consumers say they are likely to increase recycling in the next year as part of their personal contribution to tackling climate change. Approximately the same number of respondents now believe that every choice I make in my daily life affects the environment. This kind of shift in consumer awareness is obviously so important in fueling new trends and creating new norms, but awareness falls flat unless we have the systems in place that can support that kind of shift. So what needs to change when it comes to our recycling infrastructure so that improvements can be made? And also, what is the risk if things stay as they are right now? So it's fantastic to see, isn't it, that there's a great de desire to recycle. Uh, what needs to change I, th I think it's the four c's so the first one is convenience so it has to be incredibly convenient for the citizen to to recycle um you know preferably for, from from their homes the second is there needs to be clarity around the messaging there's there's a huge amount of confusion about what can be recycled and what can't be recycled uh in the uk we some, so we see something called wish recycling which is People really wish stuff can be recycled and they put it in the recycling, which is actually not good news because it, it means that that, that, that that waste stream can be contaminated and it's much harder to sort out. So there needs to be real clarity uh, about the messaging to consumers so they know what needs to go where. Um, the third C is confidence. So a consumer needs to feel completely confident that when they're doing the right thing themselves, that industry and the waste industry is doing the right thing. So you know, if they think it's being recycled, is it really being recycled? Where is it being recycled? You know, what is the transparency of that system? Uh, and if that transparency breaks down or stories appear that it's actually been dumped uh, in a different country, then, then, you, then you lose the, the consumer because they feel their efforts have been wasted. And then the final thing, and I know this is really important to Tetra Pak, is we need to create the fourth C, which is to close the loop, to create circularity. So that when you recycle something, the best thing to do is to turn it as closely as you can back to that product so that, that you keep the loop together and, and that product stays within the system. So, you know, if we recycle something and it get, gets downgraded each time, then eventually it will become waste. So, so you need a, a, a closed loop economy. So those are the four C's. That's, that's, that's what needs to change as far as I'm concerned. What, what happens if it doesn't? Well... We've currently got a linear society, a linear waste stream where, you know, something is produced, uh, the consumer uses it, they throw it away and it gets burnt or gets dumped into a hole in the ground. And we just have to look around to know that that's not sustainable. You know, the, 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 the earth is shouting at us that we cannot carry on with this 
consumption patterns we have. We've seen extreme weather events, floods, fires. These are all signs that the things that the scientists have been telling us for a long time will come to pass through climate change, through unsustainable use of resources. That they're, they're happening, and they're happening now, and even in countries potentially well equipped to cope, like Germany, the devastation of the floods that they saw are huge. So this is something which society needs to deal with now, and it has to deal with it at all levels. So we need to have some fundamental shifts away from this linear production line. Um, and, you know, we need to start thinking about how is something produced in the first place? What's the impact that's having on the climate? What's the impact it's having on biodiversity, on forests and nature? We then have to think as consumers, you know, do we really need this stuff? We, we overconsume an awful lot. A lot gets thrown away, particularly with food. So we have to be much more conscious uh, of, of what we're consuming and consume much more thoughtfully. Um, and then we need to make sure that if we're throwing stuff away, that we're doing the right thing by it, that it's, it's, big, it's being into this sort of circular economy and that all the infrastructure is in place to help that happen. So these are fairly fundamental changes, but we have to make them if we're to get off this path uh, of, of sort of uh, unsustainability, which is what we're currently on. Do you see this as an effort being made across borders um, as a global effort? Because I feel like even here in, in the United States, depending on the county or the state, the, the recycling system is different. So it's so hard as a consumer, like you said, to know what can I recycle. And there is a lot of recycling going on. I'm guilty of it myself. And so you reach a point where like, maybe it's better I just don't even recycle at all because I don't want to be guilty of ruining a recycling batch. Um, so what, what do you see? Like, obviously, it has to happen on all fronts at the same time. We have to work for innovation. We have to update our systems. It has to be more awareness and education. But do you think this is more of like a come together as a global effort to make this right? I think you're right. I think, you know, it is a very piecemeal system at the moment uh, from authority to authority, municipalities to country to country. Um, and that creates confusion and it creates massive inefficiencies. And, and I think the only way we're going to get through this is through a global effort, but more importantly, through collaboration, collaboration between uh, the waste sector, between the retailers and between the manufacturers. And, and what, what, what do you need to create collaboration? You need brave leaders. So you need companies to step up and say, we truly believe this is important. And we will step outside of our comfort zone and we will go and talk to sectors that we don't normally talk to. Because if we don't do that, you know, although potentially we could say that's not our problem, that's their problem. It's actually not. It's a global problem and everybody has to share that. So that's why the role of leading companies like Tetra Pak and others is so crucial to build the collaboration, to take the leadership role that's needed so that we have standardized systems and, and a consistent movement. Uh, to change things at the scale and speed that's needed. I suggest that we add a fifth C here, collaboration. It seems like that's also a pretty important part in fueling the recycling future. That's right. And you should always have things in odd numbers. And I, if I'd have been a bit clever, I should have added collaboration. So you're exactly <laughs> right. Next time I will. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. Maybe I can pick up on, on that, Truman, because you're absolutely right that we is the industry, we need to step up. Of course, we can always talk about collaborations, about partnerships, about governments. But, you know, unless we do our part, this is not going to happen. And, and really, Tetra Pak, as you know, this is really at the heart of who we are. Not only, let's say, as the strategic priority, but it's at the heart of who we are. And we are making some very significant investment, both in, in recycling infrastructure and in consumer education programs, we have increased the number of, of operations that actually recycle cartons worldwide from 40 to more than 170, which is nowhere near enough, but it is a big step in the, in the right direction, as you said, and it is uh, at the top of our strategic agenda to ensure that we work in partnerships, we work in collaborations throughout the value chain all the way from designing packaging solutions for recycling, because that's also important, right? That we start really before the, the product is even, even made. Uh, through consumer awareness and engagement programs, supporting collection and, and sorting of cartons, expanding the capacity of recycling, as I said, but also 
uh, growing the aftermarket, the recycled materials and applications. We need to also, you know, get involved in that area so that there is a market for the recycled products. So to create a pull through the system. And we are doing this, as you said, in collaborations and, and through coalitions, both on a global and, and local level, because we need to work both global and local. So, yeah, it's a very important area for us and, and something that is very close to our heart and, and the highest priority for our company. The home has been redefined as a sanctuary, sanctuary workplace, classroom, shopping mall and more, significantly shifting our daily routines and rituals. And with mindful consumers screaming for zero waste ways of living, there are exciting opportunities for food and drink brands to gain relevance by helping stabilize these new habits. So Lars, I have a question for you. What are your top three recommendations for helping brands find a space on this new post COVID-19 shopping list? Well, first of all, there is a huge opportunity for brands, um, especially if you think that 61% of the consumers that we saw in the index, they expect food and beverage companies to lead the way in finding solutions. And for me, it's a bit hard to narrow it down to, to three. Um, but let me think, I mean, the most pressing are, the first one is that there's a huge increase in how we consumers protect our health. So 62% of consumers are paying more attention to what they're consuming. And there is a real desire for functional foods to boost immune system and, and gut health. We see that in many, many parts of the world, not only the developed world, but in developing parts of the world as well. And there's a real desire for, for you know, with a particular interest in the natural foods, I would say. So I'm really passionate about how is it possible to produce healthy, nutritional products without the needs of preservatives. So you can take an example um, like uh, hummus, for instance, which has a shelf life of up to a week, maybe when made at home or stored in the fridge. And, and if you heat treat that, uh, heat treat that in, a, in a short and controlled way and with a predetermined temperature that, you know, and also package it in, in a septic packaging, it can have a, a, a very long shelf life uh, and, and eliminate waste basically as well, as we talked about before. So it does help to eliminate food waste. This feeds into the, the next point that I was thinking about, which is the importance of clear and simple labeling. I mean, it is not new, but it is something that is so important that there is clear, simple, understandable labeling related to expiry dates and of course also list of in ingredients for the purpose of food waste and also health benefits. And the third one, I think is the provision of environmentally sound packaging. It will be vital. It, you see in the index there that, that because 84% of respondents actually say that the usage of environmentally sound packaging would make them more likely to consider the brand. 84% you know, say that, that environmentally sound packaging would make them more likely to consider the brand. That's a huge shift compared to just a, a couple of years ago. And, and of course, we need to play our part to, to protect the, the world's resources. So. so what I'm hearing is that there is a sense of responsibility from the industry to make the shifts needed into a better world. But there's also a push and a demand from the consumer side to actually fund this, this transition. So there's opportunity for business and growth. Um, as well as an opportunity to shift into a more circular economy over this linear economy we're operating from right now. In my opinion, very climate optimistic news, and um, I'm thrilled and excited about all the findings uh, in this most recent report. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for your contribution and to all the work you're doing to this world. So good to have you here. <laughs>